understanding leads to freedom. In many countries of the world, investigating officers follow certain practices aimed at extracting confessions from their victim and also changing his personality if needed. By a judicious choice of physical and moral deprivations and by persuasions, the old personality is broken down and a new personality established in its place. The man under investigation hears so many times repeated that he is an enemy of the state and a traitor to his country, that a day comes when something breaks down in him, and he begins to feel with full conviction that he is a traitor, a rebel, altogether despicable, and deserving the direct punishment. This process is known as brainwashing. It struck me that the religious and yogic practices are very similar to brainwashing. The same physical and mental deprivation, solitary confinement, a powerful sense of sin, despair, and a desire to escape through expiation and conversion, adoption of a new image of oneself and impersonating that image. The same repetition of set formulas. God is good, the group party knows. Faith will save me. In the so-called yogic or religious practices, the same mechanism operates. The mind is made to concentrate on some particular idea to the exclusion of all other ideas, and concentration is powerfully reinforced by rigid discipline and painful austerities. A high price in life and happiness is paid, and what one gets in return appears therefore to be of great importance. This prearranged conversion, obvious or hidden, religious or political, ethical or social, may look genuine and lasting, yet there is a feeling of artificiality about it. You are quite right. By undergoing so many hardships, the mind gets dislocated and immobilized. Its condition becomes precarious. Whatever it undertakes ends in a deeper bondage. Then why are sadhanas prescribed? Unless you make tremendous efforts, you will not be convinced that effort will take you nowhere. The self is so self-confident that unless it is totally discouraged, it will not give up. Mere verbal conviction is not enough. Hard facts alone can show the absolute nothingness of the self-image. The brainwasher drives me mad, and the guru drives me sane. The driving is similar, yet the motive and the purpose are totally different. The similarities are, perhaps, merely verbal. Inviting or compelling to suffer contains in it violence, and the fruit of violence cannot be sweet. There are certain life situations, inevitably painful, and you have to take them in your stride. There are also certain situations which you have created, either deliberately or by neglect, and from these you have to learn a lesson so that they are not repeated again. It seems that we must suffer so that we learn to overcome pain. Pain has to be endured. There is no such thing as overcoming the pain and no training is needed. Training for the future, developing attitudes is a sign of fear. Once I know how to face pain, I am free of it, not afraid of it, and therefore happy. This is what happens to a prisoner. He accepts his punishment as just and proper and is at peace with the prison authorities in the state. All religions do nothing else but preach acceptance and surrender. We are being encouraged to plead guilty, to feel responsible for all the evils in the world, and point at ourselves as their only cause. My problem is, I cannot see much difference between brainwashing and sadhana, except that in the case of sadhana, one is not physically constrained. The element of compulsive suggestion is present in both. As you have said, the similarities are superficial. You need not harp on them. Sir, the similarities are not superficial. Man is a complex being and can be at the same time the accuser and the accused, the judge, the warden, and the executioner. There is not much that is voluntary in a voluntary sadhana. One is moved by forces beyond one's ken and control. I can change my mental metabolism as little as the physical, except with painful and protracted efforts, which is yoga. All I am asking is this. Does Maharaj agree with me that yoga implies violence? 
I agree that yoga, as presented by you, means violence, and I never advocate any form of violence. My path is totally nonviolent. I mean exactly what I say. Nonviolent. Find out for yourself what it is. I merely say, it is nonviolent. I am not misusing words. When a guru asks me to meditate 16 hours a day for the rest of my life, I cannot do it without extreme violence to myself. Is such a guru right or wrong? None compels you to meditate 16 hours a day unless you feel like doing so. It is only a way of telling you remain with yourself. Don't get lost among others. The teacher will wait, but the mind is impatient. It is not the teacher. It is the mind that is violent, and also afraid of its own violence. What is of the mind is relative. It is a mistake to make it into an absolute. If I remain passive, nothing will change. If I am active, I must be violent. What is it I can do which is neither sterile nor violent? Of course, there is a way which is neither violent nor sterile and yet supremely effective. Just look at yourself as you are. See yourself as you are. Accept yourself as you are and go ever deeper into what you are. Violence and nonviolence describe your attitude to others. The self in relation to itself is neither violent nor nonviolent. It is either aware or unaware of itself. If it knows itself, all it does will be right. If it does not, all it does will be wrong. What do you mean by saying, I know myself as I am? Before the mind, I am. I am is not a thought in the mind. The mind happens to me. I do not happen to the mind. And since time and space are in the mind, I am beyond time and space, eternal and omnipresent. Are you serious? Do you really mean that you exist everywhere and at all times? Yes, I do. To me, it is as obvious as the freedom of movement is to you. Imagine a tree asking a monkey, Do you seriously mean that you can move from place to place? And the monkey is saying, Yes, I do. Are you also free from causality? Can you produce miracles? The world itself is a miracle. I am beyond miracles. I am absolutely normal. With me, everything happens as it must. I do not interfere with creation. Of what use are small miracles to me when the greatest of miracles is happening all the time? Whatever you see, it is always your own being that you see. Go ever deeper into yourself. Seek within. There is neither violence nor nonviolence in self-discovery. The destruction of the false is not violence. When I practice self-inquiry or go within with the idea that it will profit me in some way or other, I'm still escaping from what I am. Quite right, true inquiry is always into something, not out of something. When I inquire how to get or avoid something, I am not really inquiring. To know anything, I must accept it, totally. Yes, to know God, I must accept God. How frightening! Before you can accept God, you must accept yourself, which is even more frightening. The first steps in self-acceptance are not at all pleasant, for what one sees is not a happy sight. One needs all the courage to go further. What helps is silence. Look at yourself in total silence. Do not describe yourself. Look at the being you believe you are and remember. You are not what you see. This I am not. What am I? Is the movement of self-inquiry. There are no other means to liberation. All means delay. Resolutely reject what you are not till the real self emerges in its glorious nothingness. It's not a thingness. The world is passing through rapid and critical changes. We can see them with great clarity in the United States though they happen in other countries. There is an increase in crime on one hand and more genuine holiness on the other. Communities are being formed and some of them 
on a very high level of integrity and austerity. It looks as if evil is destroying itself by its own successes, like a fire which consumes its fuel, while the good, like life, perpetuates itself. As long as you divide events into good and evil, you may be right. In fact, good becomes evil, and evil becomes good by their own fulfillment. What about love? When it turns to lust, it becomes destructive. What is lust? Remembering, imagining, anticipating. It is sensory and verbal, a form of addiction. Is brahmacharya, continence, imperative in yoga? A life of constraint and suppression is not yoga. Mind must be free of desires and relaxed. It comes with understanding, not with determination, which is but another form of memory. An understanding mind is free of desires and fears. How can I make myself understand? By meditating, which means giving attention. Become fully aware of your problem. Look at it from all sides. Watch how it affects your life. Then leave it alone. You can't do more than that. Will it set me free? You are free from what you have understood. The outer expressions of freedom make time to appear, but they are already there. Do not expect perfection. There is no perfection in manifestation. Details must clash. No problem is solved completely, but you can withdraw from it to a level on which it does not operate. Past and future are only in the mind. Being applies to the now only. How does the jnani proceed when he needs something to be done? Does he make plans, decide about details and execute them? Jnani understands a situation fully and knows at once what needs to be done. That is all. The rest happens by itself. And to a large extent unconsciously, the Niani's identity with all that is is so complete that as he responds to the universe, so does the universe respond to him. He is supremely confident that once a situation has been cognized, events will move in adequate response. The ordinary man is personally concerned. He counts his risks and chances, while the Niani remains aloof, sure that all will happen as it must. And it does not matter much what happens, for ultimately the return to balance and harmony is inevitable. The heart of things is at peace. I understand that personality is an illusion, and alert detachment without loss of identity is our point of contact with reality. Will you please tell me, at this moment are you a person or a self-aware identity? I am both but the real self cannot be described except in terms supplied by the person and terms of what I am not. All you can tell about the person is not the self, and you can tell nothing about the self, which would not refer to the person. As it is, as it could be, as it should be, all attributes are personal. The real is beyond all attributes. Are you sometimes the self and sometimes the person? How can I be? The person is what I appear to be to other persons. To myself, I am the infinite expanse of consciousness in which innumerable persons emerge and disappear in endless succession. How is it that the person, which to you is quite illusory, appears real to us? You, the self, being the root of all being. Consciousness and joy impart your reality to whatever you perceive. The imparting of reality takes place invariably in the now and at no other time, because past and future are only in the mind. Being applies to the now only. Is not eternity endless too? Time is endless, though limited. Eternity is in the split moment of the now. We miss it because the mind is ever shuttling between the past and the future. It will not stop to focus the now. It can be nothing with comparative ease if interest is aroused. What arouses interest? 
earnestness, the sign of maturity. And how does maturity come about? By keeping your mind clear and clean, by living your life in full awareness of every moment as it happens, by examining and dissolving one's desires and fears as soon as they arise. Is such concentration at all possible? Try. One step at a time is easy. Energy flows from earnestness. I find I am not earnest enough. Self-betrayal is a grievous matter. It rots the mind like cancer. The remedy lies in clarity and integrity of thinking. Try to understand that you live in a world of illusions. Examine them and uncover their roots. The very attempt to do so will make you earnest, for there is bliss in right endeavor. Where will it lead me? Where can it lead you if not to its own perfection? Once you are well established in the now, you have nowhere else to go. What you are timelessly you express eternally. Are you one or many? I am one, but appear as many. Why does one appear at all? It is good to be and to be conscious. Life is sad. Ignorance causes sorrow. Happiness follows understanding. Why should ignorance be painful? It is at the root of all desire and fear, which are painful states and the source of endless errors. I have seen people supposed to have realized laughing and crying. Does it not show that they are not free of desire and fear? They may laugh and cry according to circumstances, but inwardly they are cool and clear, watching detachedly their own spontaneous reactions. Appearances are misleading, and more so in the case of a Niani. I do not understand you. The mind cannot understand, for the mind is trained for grasping and holding, while the niyani is not grasping and not holding. What am I holding on to? Which do you not? You are a creature of memories. At least you imagine yourself to be so. I am entirely unimagined. I am what I am, not identifiable with any physical or mental state. An accident would destroy your equanimity. The strange fact is that it does not. To my own surprise, I am as I am, pure awareness, alert to all that happens. Even at the moment of death, what is it to me that the body dies? Don't you need it to contact the world? I do not need the world, nor am I in one. The world you think of is in your own mind. I can see it through your eyes and mine, but I am fully aware that it is a projection of memories. It is touched by the real only at the point of awareness, which can be only now. The difference between us seems to be that while I keep on saying that I do not know my real self, you maintain that you know it well. Is there any difference between us? There is no difference between us, nor can I say that I know myself. I know that I am not describable nor definable. There is a vastness beyond the farthest reaches of the mind. That vastness is my home. That vastness is myself. And that vastness is also love. You see love everywhere while I see hatred and suffering. The history of humanity is the history of murder, individual and collective. No other living being so delights in killing. If you go into the motives, you will find love, love of oneself, and love of one's own. People fight for what they imagine they love. Surely their love must be real enough when they are ready to die for it. Love is boundless. What is limited to a few cannot be called love. Do you know such unlimited love? Yes, I do. How does it feel? All is loved and lovable. Nothing is excluded. Not even the ugly and the criminal. All is within my consciousness. All is my own. It is madness to split oneself through likes and dislikes. I am beyond both. I am not alienated. To be free from like and dislike is a state of indifference. It may look and feel so in the beginning, 
persevere in such indifference, and it will blossom into an all-pervading and all-embracing love. One has such moments when the mind becomes a flower and a flame, but they do not last, and the life reverts to its daily grayness. Discontinuity is the law. When you deal with the concrete, the continuous cannot be experienced, for it has no borders. Consciousness implies alterations. Change follows change. When one thing or state comes to an end and another begins, that which has no borderline cannot be experienced in the common meaning of the word. One can only be it without knowing, but one can know what it is not. It is definitely not the entire content of consciousness which is always on the move. If the immovable cannot be known, what is the meaning and purpose of its realization? To realize the immovable means to become immovable, and the purpose is the good of all that lives. But life is movement, immobility is death. Of what use is death to life? I am talking of immovability, not immobility. You become immovable in reticence. You become a power which gets all things right. It may or may not imply intense outward activity, but the mind remains deep and quiet. As I watch my mind, I find it changing all the time, mood succeeding mood in infinite variety, while well, you seem to be perpetually in the same mood of cheerful benevolence. Moods are in the mind and do not matter. Go within, go beyond. Cease being fascinated by the content of your consciousness. When you reach the deep layers of your true being, you will find that the mind's surface play affects you very little. There will be play all the same. A quiet mind is not a dead mind. Consciousness is always in movement. It is an observable fact. Immovable consciousness is a contradiction. When you talk of a quiet mind, what is it? Is not mind the same as consciousness? We must remember that words are used in many ways according to the context. The fact is there is little difference between the conscious and the unconscious. They are essentially the same. The waking state differs from deep sleep in the presence of the witness. A ray of awareness illumines a part of our mind and that part becomes our dream or waking consciousness. While awareness appears as the witness, the witness usually knows only consciousness. Sadhana consists in the witness turning back first on his consciousness, then upon himself, in his own awareness. Self-awareness is yoga. If awareness is all-pervading, then a blind man, once realized, can see. You are mixing sensation with awareness. The jnani knows himself as he is. He is also aware of his body being crippled and his mind being deprived of a range of sensory perceptions but he is not affected by the availability of eyesight nor its absence. My question is more specific. When a blind man becomes a niani, will his eyesight be restored to him or not? Unless his eyes and brain undergo a renovation, how can he see? How will they undergo a renovation? They may or may not. It all depends on destiny and grace. But a niani commands a mode of spontaneous, non-sensory perception, which makes him know things directly, without the intermediary of the senses. He is beyond the perceptual and the conceptual, beyond the categories of time and space, name and shape. He is neither the perceived nor the perceiver, but the simple and the universal factor that makes perceiving possible. Reality is within consciousness, but it is not consciousness nor any of its contents. What is false, the world or my knowledge of it? Is there a world outside your knowledge? Can you go beyond what you know? You may postulate a word beyond the mind, but it will remain a concept unproved and unprovable. Your experience is your proof, and it is valid for you only. Who else can have your experience? when the other person is only as real as he appears in your experience. Am I so hopelessly lonely? You are as a person. 
In your real being, you are the whole. Are you a part of the world which I have in consciousness, or are you independent? What you see is yours, and what I see is mine. The two have little in common. There must be some common factor which unites us. To find the common factor, you must abandon all distinctions. Only the universal is in common. What strikes me as exceedingly strange is that while you say that I am merely a product of my memories and woefully limited, I create a vast and rich world in which everything is contained, including you and your teaching. How this vastness is created and contained in my smallness is what I find hard to understand. Maybe you are giving me the whole truth, but I am grasping only a small part of it. Yet it is a fact. The small projects the whole, but it cannot contain the whole. However great and complete is your world, it is self-contradictory and transitory and altogether illusory. It must be illusory, yet it is marvelous. When I look and listen, touch, smell, and taste, think and feel, remember and imagine, I cannot but be astonished at my miraculous creativity. I look through a microscope or telescope and see wonders. I follow the track of an atom and hear the whisper of the stars. If I am the sole creator of all this, then I am God indeed. But if I am God, why do I appear so small and helpless to myself? You are God, but you do not know it. If I am God, then the world I create must be true. It is true, in essence, but not in appearance. Be free of desires and fears, and at once your vision will clear and you shall see all things as they are. Or you may say that Satoguna creates the world, the Tomaguna obscures it, and the Rajoguna distorts. This does not tell me much, because if I ask what are the Gunas, the answer will be what creates, what obscures, what distorts. The fact remains, something unbelievable happened to me, and I do not understand what has happened, how and why. Well. Wonder is the dawn of wisdom. To be steadily and consistently wondering is sadhana. I am in a world which I do not understand, and therefore I am afraid of it. This is everybody's experience. You have separated yourself from the world, therefore it pains and frightens you. Discover your mistake and be free of fear. You are asking me to give up the world while I want to be happy in the world. If you ask for the impossible, who can help you? The limited is bound to be painful and pleasant in turns. If you seek real happiness, unassailable and unchangeable, you must leave the world with its pains and pleasures behind you. How is it to be done? Mere physical renunciation is only a token of earnestness. But earnestness alone does not liberate. There must be understanding which comes with alert perceptivity, eager inquiry, and deep investigation. You must work relentlessly for your salvation from sin and sorrow. What is sin? All that binds you.